Amen. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. All right, so keep your place in James chapter 2. I had an idea for a sermon tonight, and I got into James chapter 2, and it was based on James chapter 2. And I decided that, you know, since I was kind of into half of James chapter 2, we're just, we're just going to rip up James chapter 2 tonight and just dissect the whole thing for you. So we're going to get a little bit doctrinal tonight, so just uh, put, your, put your thinking caps on. James chapter 2 is a chapter in the Bible that I actually didn't really uh, enjoy that much when I first started reading the Bible. You know, I read things and I was like, oh, why did, why did God have to say that? You know, that's kind of confusing. You know, because it sounds, it's, it's a chapter where people, especially when you're out soul winning, especially in a Catholic area. So it's going to be very valuable tonight if you listen and take some notes on these things. They're going to throw some verses in your face from James chapter 2. Okay? So what I want to do is I just kind of want to expound James chapter 2 to you into three points tonight. So I want to break it down into three um, easy points for us to understand. Now, the book of James is written by James, the brother of Jesus. There was uh, two, two James in the Bible. Uh, the first James was, of course, killed in Acts chapter 12. Um, he was James, the son of Zebedee, and he was killed by Herod, uh, the Bible tells us. This was James. This was the other James. He is a, he's, a, he's a man that's in Jerusalem. We don't know exactly James's title in Jerusalem, uh, but we do know that he was somebody of merit in, in Jerusalem. He was somebody in the church in Jerusalem that had some, um, he had some pull. If you remember in Acts chapter 15, we won't go there, but there was a question about the Gentiles being circumcised because the gospel was going out to the whole world and Paul and Barnabas came back and there was a question about, you know, how do we handle these Gentiles that are getting saved and what do we tell them to do? And everybody kind of expounded their opinions, but it was James who gave sentence. So James was somebody of, of respect in, in the church. So what James does in, in the book of James is he's basically teaching us how, he's teaching us how to do this religion. Okay, he's teaching us how to do this religion. And that's the title of my sermon tonight is, How to Do Your Religion. Okay, so I'm going to give you three points tonight from James chapter 2 on how to do your religion. Now, the first point I want to make tonight, let's just start with James chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4, where the Bible reads, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and he have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say unto the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. So the first point tonight that James is making in James chapter 2 is don't be a respecter of persons. The church, the New Testament church, is going to be this place where people of all different backgrounds come together. You know, you're, you're going to come from different, maybe there's going to be rich people in here, maybe there's going to be poor people in here. But what he's saying, and, and I kind of tend to think when I'm reading this, that this was a specific issue that the church in Jerusalem was dealing with. So James chapter, uh, you know, the verses 1 through 4, he's telling you, like, hey, don't have respect to the rich people. That, you know, the rich people aren't any, any better. You know, and just aside from just the rich and the poor, you know, the, this is going to be a meeting place of all different cultures. You know, people from all different backgrounds. You know, I remember, um, you know, I have many people at, at Verity Baptist Sacramento where I've, I've talked with them. We're great friends now, but we almost laugh about it that they came from such a different culture that I did. But it matters not, okay? Because, you know, the Bible, turn to Acts chapter 17, and let's look at this idea of, of cultures in the Bible. You know, there's a lot of talk about, about race today, especially in America today, you know, of different races. But the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race, that we are all of the same blood and there is one race. And in Acts chapter 17, we can see this. And starting in verse number 24, the Bible reads, you know, uh, Paul here is talking to the Athenians and he's explaining to them, you know, about this God that we have, the God of the Bible. And in verse number 24, Paul says, God hath made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Of course, the Athenians uh, were worshiping all these different gods, all these different statues. 
and have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now, we may come from different cultures, all of us here, or some of us here, but we're all of one blood, the Bible teaches. And we're not to have respect to any person, period, that's in this church. Okay? Now, we're not going to have a hip-hop culture in this church. But on the flip side of that coin, we're not going to have a honky-tonk redneck culture either. We're going to have the culture of the Bible in this church. So it doesn't matter where you came from, the culture you came from. What James is saying is that they have no respect of persons. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Okay, so this is a very uh, simple point that he's making in the first few verses here. And then in, in verse number 5, it gets even better. We get back to this, this economic disparity um, that he's seeing in the church. In verse number 5, uh, James says, Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, of he kingdom which he had promised to them that love him? Now just go ahead and underline rich in faith in your Bible. Now, hath not God chosen the poor of this world? Now what, what does that mean? Is that Calvinist? Are certain people chosen by God? No. The answer is that they are rich in faith. Now, in verse 6, it gets even better. You know, if you ever get confused by some certain statement in the Bible, you know, just read another couple verses. That's a good uh, tip for you. But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men... See, he's like, you have despised the poor, but do not the rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat. So he's like, why would you despise the poor? It's the rich who are throwing you in jail, who are torturing you, who are doing all these terrible things to you. You know, this was under the Roman Empire. I mean, the persecution that was coming to these men, to this church in Jerusalem under the Roman Empire, made the persecution of the Jews look like, you know, Candyland. It, it, it was coming. So he's saying the rich men are the ones that oppress you. Why would you lift them up, of all people? You know, if you ever read about, you know, oppression in this world, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an ugly picture. You know, no matter what part of history you read in. I remember, you know, reading about, I read about a lot of uh, Soviet Russia, the communists in the, you know, the early 1900s under Stalin, the things that were done to people there. You know, men are, are inventors of evil things, and men will oppress each other. Now, when you think about, one thing I like to think about about salvation, just think about the design of salvation. You know, the Bible says here that the, he has chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. Now think of the design of salvation in an oppressive world. Okay? Belief. Salvation, according to the Bible, is, is according to your faith, your belief. Now isn't it funny that your belief is the one thing that no one can take from you or force you into? Isn't that funny? I mean, I remember there was a book I read about this, this same book about communist Russia, and this guy who had been thrown into the gulag system was talking about you know, they would basically go into these towns and arrest dozens and dozens of people. Stalin had quotas on how many people to arrest. And they would go and they would pull all these people out of these towns and they would make them sign these confessions. They were all just made up to fill the quotas. But they would say, hey, you know, Brother David, you've done this, you signed this confession. And the guy, the author said it was stupid for people to resist because they were beaten and tortured to the point where they were almost killed where they would just sign it anyway. Because you can oppress men to sign confessions and to say things and to do certain things and to rat other people out or to, just to lie and make things up, but you cannot force belief. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That God designed it that way? You know, belief is something that's yours and no one can take it from you. Amen. Which is why, you know, he's chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Now look, salvation by belief takes humility. Right? It takes, you know, we'll often say this to people soul winning. I'll ask people, do you think most people are going to heaven? I'll, I'll ask that question to certain people. And, you know, depending on what their answer is, you know, I'll ask, you know, because it's a free gift. Why wouldn't everybody get it? Because it's hard and it takes a humble person to say, you know what, I have nothing to do with this. I have nothing to do with my salvation. That takes a humble person. And guess who are the most humble people? It's the people who are, who are poor in this world. And you're going to find that if you're not a soul winner tonight, you're going to learn that. As you come out soul winning, 
in, for this church and with this church, you are going to learn when we go into the, the, the lower income neighborhoods, people are much more receptive to the gospel because they're rich in faith. Right. See? Because the Bible's true. Because everything in the Bible is true. Right. And you're going to find when you go to higher class neighborhoods where the houses are nicer and, you know, I mean, there's, there's soul winners who pull up into a nice neighborhood with million dollar homes and they're just like, ugh. Because they know, look, rich people can get saved. I mean, we've all seen it. And in a sense, we're all rich here. So we're kind of proof that, that rich people can get saved. But you're going to just see it's much less receptive. Because somebody that is wealthy and, you know, richer than the poor person, they think they have things figured out. They don't have that humility. Right. So soul winning will show you this. Soul winning will show you so many things about people. You know, that's one thing. It's so profitable to you. And I don't want to talk about profit yet. We'll get there. But so that's the first thing. Don't be a respecter of persons. We're all coming together. We all came from different backgrounds. James is saying, don't be a respecter of persons, economic, culturally, whatever. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Continue looking down at James chapter 2. And this, my second point is this. Let's uh, look at James chapter 2, and let's start in verse number 9, actually, um, where he's finishing up the respect of persons um, thought, and he says, but if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. And then we get into verse number 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Now, this is another verse that will be thrown in your face. Um, I use this all the time soul winning. I'm sure a lot of people do. But this is a verse that just basically explains that if you have broken the law at one point, you become a transgressor of the law. Period. This does not anywhere say that all sin is equal. And that all sin, I mean, is that what it says? Once again, read the verse before and read the verse after. He's talking about, but if you become respect of persons, one specific thing he's talking about, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For he said, and if we look at verse 11, the verse after, for he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So it's just about becoming a transgressor of the law. He's just showing that one sin is enough to get you to be a transgressor of the law. Because really there's two ways to heaven, right? The first way is be perfect. The second way is, you know, grace through faith. Amen. All right? Now, no one's perfect, obviously. So he's pointing out that, you know, that the all sin is equal is a whole sermon in itself. I don't want to get too deep into that, but that's a, a common thing that's out there. It's a liberal Christian thing. It's weird. Uh, I, it doesn't make any sense. Another good tip of the Bible, by the way, is if something doesn't make sense to your, to your logic, to your, I'm, I'm a very logical person. I like to think through things, maybe almost to a fault sometimes. If something just doesn't sound right logically, look into it more. Because God gave you your common sense. You know, God wrote the law in your heart. God's a very, the Bible's a very logical book. It makes sense to us. Okay? Um, now, Let's continue in verse uh, number 12. And the second point is this, that James is going to make. And the second point in James chapter 2 is don't be a hypocrite. Okay? In James chapter 2, continuing in verse 12, he says, well, let's just go back to verse 11. For he that saith, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, that if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, is they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. And verse 13 is the, is the verse... Turn to Matthew 7 while I'm reading this. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth, rejoiceth against judgment. Now that sounds a lot, about, uh, a lot like Matthew 7, where Jesus says, Judge not that ye be not judged. And then he says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you again. So the Bible here is saying that you need to walk the walk. And if you continue reading in, in Matthew chapter 7, in verse number 3, the Bible says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite. Notice how he doesn't say just leave the beam in your brother's eye. He says, Thou hypocrite. You're being a hypocrite. You're doing what you're judging people against. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So basically, 
what James is saying in these next few verses, don't be a hypocrite. Know that you're going to be judged by the same judgment that you judge other, other people by. And if we know that, maybe you'll show a little bit more mercy towards people. You know, so he's, he's teaching this church at Jerusalem, which is great lessons for us on how to do church with your brothers and sisters. You know, have a little bit of compassion and a little bit of mercy with people. You know, because you're going to be, you know, you come down hard on your brothers and on your sisters, God's coming down hard on you. And, and I want, I want, I need God's mercy in my life. And, and I think you probably need it in your life as well. All right, now let's get into the best part of James chapter 2. In verse 14, we start with the best part. Now I want you, the answer to everything that I'm about to say is in, is in the first four words of verse 14, what James is talking about here. And the Bible reads in James chapter 2 and verse 14, What doth it profit, my brethren, Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now just underline in your Bible, what doth it profit? What does it profit? What doth it profit? The third point tonight is be profitable. Be profitable in your Christian life. If we continue and read in verse 15, If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, and be warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead. Being alone. There it is. Faith without works is dead. <laughs> yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without works, and I will show thee my faith by my work. So here's Bible reading tip number two tonight. Base your doctrine on clear scriptures. Period. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, which is probably, I'm sure most of you have it memorized, which is debatably one of the most clear scriptures in the entire Bible. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I'm going to wait for everybody to get there so you can read the words as I read them. So whenever we're reading the Bible, and we read some obscure verse, or not even a verse, but a phrase that sounds like it might have one or two or three meanings, but it goes against a clear scripture in the Bible that's a clear statement in the Bible, not a parable, not a story, but a clear statement in the Bible, we must be interpreting the verse that we read wrong. Because we should always base our doctrine on clear statements and clear scriptures in the Bible. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9 reads, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the what? The gift of God. And then just to make sure we all get it, he says it again. He says, not of works, lest any man should boast. There it is, folks. For by grace are ye saved through faith. It wouldn't make any sense if what James chapter 2 in that one phrase said meant that, you know, suddenly you're not saved anymore. First of all, that's not even what it says. Okay? Now, what James is getting at, well, first of all, think about it this way. And, you know, maybe I overanalyze things, but think of God as, uh, as an engineer. Okay? God designed salvation, right? And he could design it any way he wanted. All right? Now, I have an object lesson here. I have a contraption. Let's say God is the engineer, right? He created this entire world. He created you. He created me. He created everything in it. He created all the systems in nature that we deal with. We're going to talk a lot about this on Thursday night. Let's say that I'm an engineer. See, part of an engineer and part of, part of an engineer's job when he designs something or creates something is let's say I created this, this uh, widget. And this widget is the best thing that's ever been created. And I'm going to give it to Brother Angel here. Brother Angel, come take it. It's got a bunch of buttons on it. And if you push, push the buttons in the right order, there's a lot of buttons. And if you push the buttons on that thing in the right order, that thing will turn into a car and you can drive it to work. But what if I don't tell you what order to push the buttons in? Does it become of any value at all to you? 
if I don't give you any instructions or any manual for that device, right? It's worthless to you, right? So here's the thing. Thank you. You sit down. <laughs> if faith is by works, even a little bit, like just a little bit of works, this book is not good enough for us. It doesn't tell us what we need to know. If faith is by works, I need more information, right? I need to know what the approved works are. I need a list of approved works to keep me saved, or to, well, first of all, to get me saved, and second of all, to keep me saved. I need to know if I do bad things, which works will cover, I mean, each work has to be weighted. I, I need a manual on how to stay saved. Otherwise, God's just throwing it up in the air, and maybe I'm going to go to hell, and maybe I'm not. But the Bible says I can know that I'm going to heaven. So that doesn't make any sense. So it can't even be a little bit by works. It doesn't make any sense. Because I need a different book. Because this, this one doesn't tell me everything I need to know. But if, if salvation is by grace through faith, I have everything I need right here. Right? So God's logical. I love him for that. I love him for a lot of things. What James is really talking about here is he's talking about a spectrum of dead faith Versus perfect faith. Okay? Let's look at that now. James chapter 2 and verse 20. Let's start reading. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? There it is again. He said it again. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? What in the world? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was his faith made perfect? There you, there you have perfect faith. So we have this dead faith, and we have this perfect faith. Does it say that if you have dead faith that you're going to hell? No. It says you have, if you have dead faith, it's the opposite of having perfect faith. And how do you get perfect faith? Well, by doing works, right? So what does it mean that was not Abraham our father justified by works? Well, let's look into that. Look at verse 23. And Scripture was fulfilled which saying, Abraham believed God... And it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Who called Abraham a friend of God? Who was that? Let's investigate. And he was called the friend of God. By who? That's what I want to know. In 2 Chronicles in chapter 20 is where you're headed. You get into those one and two books, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. Chapter 20, look at verse number 5. We'll start reading there. And the Bible reads, And Jehoshaphat, who was a king of Judah, stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over the, all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might? so that none is able to withstand thee. Art not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, forever? Jehoshaphat called Abraham the friend of God. Okay, and why, why did he call him that? So basically, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that Abraham was called the friend of God because he was justified before men by his works. He was justified before men. You say, I don't believe you. Turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. New Testament. Acts, Romans. In Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 1, the Bible reads, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory but not before God. You see? There's the answer. Abraham was justified by his works before men. When he sacrificed, when he went to sacrifice Isaac on the altar and he was willing to do it, men saw that. How was he justified? How was righteousness imputed to him? Because he believed God. I'll often say it to people that I'm soul winning with, hey, you know, I'll, I'll check with them as I'm going through the gospel presentation with them. Do you believe these things? Do you believe what I'm telling you right now? And here's the truth of it. They'll tell me if they believe it or not, but I don't really know. Right? 
I mean, I don't really know. I'll say that. I'll say, you know, only God sees your heart. Even before I pray with people, I'll many times say, you know, it's the belief in your heart that saves you. Because only God can see your heart. I'm just a man. You're just a man. The only way I can see your works is by, or your faith is by what you do. Because I'm just a man. So that is what James is saying. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. That's what he said. So that is the answer. Now, in Romans 3.22, we see, you know, we can see how we're justified or how we're imputed. This righteousness of God is given to us. And the Bible reads, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that what? Believe. For there is no difference. So the conclusion here is that Abraham's works justified him before men. Isn't the Bible a, a deep book? You can't just skim over these things and be like, oh, there's three words. Sounds kind of funny. I'm going to base all my doctrine on that. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Abraham was justified before works. And you know, another thing I, I love about the Bible and what James did here is he gives us another example. It's kind of a complicated subject. He gives us another example. Turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And then if we look at James 2.25, I'll just read it to you. James continues, he says, Likewise, meaning another example of the same thing is what he's going to tell you. Likewise also was Rahab the harlot justified by works. Now, so Rahab the harlot was justified by works? Look what he says next. When she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. Now, if you remember... Before the people of Israel came into the promised land, the very first battle was the battle of Jericho. They sent spies in to find out what was going on. And Rahab the harlot received them. She had heard about this God that was destroying all these people. And she had faith in this God. We'll see this. And she helped them. But you see these spies, they're spies. It's espionage for crying out loud, right? It's espionage. How are they to trust her? How was she justified how was she justified to these men? Well, she was justified because she sent them out another way, by her works. That's how she was justified to them. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, we see how Rahab was, how, how she, was, she was saved. And the Bible says, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. By faith, she was saved. But she was justified before those men by what she did for them, by her works. Okay, so, it's beautiful. I mean, the only way that I can see your faith is through your works, period. And then if we go all the way back to the, the verse I told you to underline in uh, verse 14, the bottom line is your works are directly proportional, meaning as your works go up, your profit goes up. So as you have more works in your life, you will profit yourself and especially those around you more. And you won't have dead faith. I mean, who would want to have dead faith? So I mean, look folks, we, we talk to people all the time about how you are not, you know, you are not saved by your works. That's what everybody's hung up on in this whole world. They're all the same. There's only two religions in the world. I mean, it's not, even, it's not even creative when you think about it. There's only two religions in the whole world. There's the religion that you have to do these things to get yourself to heaven. You know, the Muslims, the Buddhists, the Catholics, the Pentecostals. You know, the poor Pentecostals, they're just living in fear constantly. You know, uh, the devout Pentecostal and the devout Catholic just are they're just trembling in fear. But they're all the same. Hinduism. You know, the devil's creative, but it's all the same game plan. It's justified by works. If I can get you to believe in your works and not the Lord Jesus Christ, I got you. That's the bottom line. Good. Now, I'll often tell people out soul winning, you know, because you'll get a devout Catholic who's maybe an older person, and they'll say, you can't tell people that. You can't tell people. So you're saying you can just go do whatever you want? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And you're still going to go to heaven. You individually. But I'll often tell people, you know, it's silly to think that just because I am saved by faith, 
and it has nothing to do with my works. It's silly to think that my works don't matter because guess what? I have three children and if I live the life of a drunkard and the life of a, a, a wicked person, what are the odds that my children, when I open the Bible up to them when they're five years old or six years old and say, hey, son, let me show you what the Bible has to say. What are the, I will be a curse upon them. And you can read plenty of places in the Bible where fathers and mothers were curses upon generations of their families. So if I could make a choice, if somebody gave me a choice like, hey, your son, you have a choice, your son's going to go to hell or you're going to go to hell. Pick one. I would much rather go to hell and take the place of, of that punishment for, for one of my children. I mean, who wouldn't make that choice? You know, what good man would not make that choice? But that's exactly what you could be doing when you're living a wicked life and you have no works and you have this dead faith. You're, you're, you're cursing your children. You're cursing those around you. You have no profit to them. Okay, look. Let me, let me close with this, this, just the, this idea. You know, who do you profit in your life? As we start this new church, you know, I think, I think about the church service this morning and some people are still here. You know, Verity Baptist Sacramento, these people profited us greatly this weekend. Amen. You know, but these people, I don't know, you know, I'm not familiar with everyone's background. I can't wait to get to know you all better. But these people that came here from Verity Baptist Sacramento, these people are sold out. They are separated. And they are soul winning machines. And they are extremely profitable people. They are extremely profitable people. They profited all kinds of people around these neighborhoods this weekend. They profited me. They encouraged me. I'm sure they encouraged a lot of you. But they're profitable people. So my, my question is, I just have two, you know, we could have a sermon series for a whole year on how to become a profitable Christian. But, you know, the two things on my mind today and this weekend and in the coming weeks is just, you know, your profit, first of all, in, in involvement in this church. How, how much are you going to profit this church? You know, let me tell you something. When you look at these people and I think about the individuals that came from Sacramento, I remember this time in my life when I started coming to church and I started coming three times a week and soul winning. It's a culture shift in your life. It takes some getting used to. You know, it's an adjustment from going to watching, to not being in church, to watching YouTube sermons, to actually being in church, being here. You know, it, it, it's a real cultural adjustment. Well, let me tell you something, it will make you a profitable person. It will make you a profitable Christian. In Matthew uh, chapter 4, I'll just read it for you. You don't have to turn there. Jesus says, Jesus had just been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible says, afterward, he was, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth excuse me, out of the mouth of God. So do you like to eat? Because that's what the Bible says that, you know, the preaching of the Word of God and the reading of God's Word should be like to you. That's how much you need it in your life. You know, you say, oh, I can go a long time without eating. Well, maybe, what about your family? You know, how long does, you, you know, your family, how long can they go out without, go without eating? How long do you want your family to go without eating? You know, how long do you want your family to, to go without hearing the Word of God? You know, so the first thing, you know, the first thing I want to say to the Fresno people here is, you know, just focus on, you know, you see, it, it's overwhelming, right? Focus on showing up. Just be here. Just be here, and then you're going to grow. You're going to grow. Just show up. That's the first thing. In Hebrews 10.25, it was in the bulletin. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, as the manner of a lot of people is, unfortunately but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So here we are, Fresno. We're here. I'm moved here. Here we are. Don't forsake it. The second thing I think about when it comes to profit, last point I want to make, in Mark 16, 15, and he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Soul winning. You know, in... Uh, a lot of people have asked me when we moved here, or when we, you know, the time was approaching, when this was actually happening, you know, in the last month or so. Like, are you nervous? Because it kind of got to this point where people realized, well, this is really happening. 
I mean, I kind of felt it happening a while ago, but a lot of people are like, this is actually, we're actually doing this. It's actually happening. They're like, are you nervous? Are you nervous about it? And, you know, there's, there's things that I, I'm nervous about, you know, preaching uh, three, two, three times a week. You know, that's, that's a little nerve-wracking, but, you know, I'm going to get better at that as time goes on. I'll just take it, you know, one sermon at a time. Those things aren't big, but let me tell you what I'm terrified about. What I'm absolutely terrified about. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. And Jesus is talking to the church at Ephesus. And I'm not joking when I say I'm terrified. Because this was the scariest thing for me as we took this new step in our lives. In Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 2, Jesus says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and they are not, and hast found them liars. These people are doing some good things. And has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Still good things. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. I, I'm terrified of, of, of I, I want to do the first works as, as hard as I possibly can. Amen. And the first works to me is preaching everything that's in this book. Whether you like it or not, because I'm not nearly as afraid of you as I am of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second thing is we're going to do the first works of going out and preaching the gospel to every creature. And we're, we're going to take it seriously. And this is the kind of church, I'm telling you right now, that this is Verity Baptist Church Sacramento and Verity Baptist Church Fresno. If I can, if I can successfully bring that culture here, this is a hard church to be halfway in on. I'm telling you that right now. I mean, this is, uh, they said it this morning, this is big boy church, folks. Okay, we're not joking around. People might be against us. Who cares? Who cares? Because when we preach all this book, people are going to get mad. And they're not going to like it. You know, we're starting. We're starting on Thursday night in the book of Romans. Because Romans is one of my favorite books in the Bible. I mean, it just is. And you're all laughing. But, you know, here's a, you know it, it's because there's so much deep doctrine in, in Romans. I love it. But here's the thing with Romans. It starts with Romans chapter 1. So you better be, decide if you're going to be in this church that you're just going to accept what the Bible says. Or you're not going to do well here. Because we're going to preach everything that this Bible says. There's a lot of love in this book. There's a lot of judgment in this book as well. And we're going to do our religion right, and we are not going to forget the first works at this church. So I'll be here Thursday night. We're going to start in Romans, Romans chapter 1. We're going to, I'm going to show you on Thursday night how you can prove to people that God exists using a glass of water. Now that's, that's fun. All right? I'm going to be here Saturday soul winning. I'm going to be here Sunday morning. I'm going to be here Sunday soul winning. And I'm going to be here Sunday night, repeat. Amen. That's how it's going to go. And if you're here, you know, I, I challenge you here today. Get, get plugged into this church. Amen. You ask some of these people from Verity Sacramento, the ones I'm even looking at right now, what, what getting plugged into a good church has done for their lives. You get plugged in here for a year, and then you talk to me if I was right or not. Amen. This book, learning this book and the preaching of this book will profit you, and it will profit your family greatly. And who doesn't want to be profitable? Be present. Become profitable. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this entire weekend. We thank you for all these people that sacrificed all this time, Lord. Um, <clears throat> I just thank you for pulling, <clears throat> excuse me, I thank you for pulling all this together and, and just such a great group of brothers and sisters to help support us to, to get this thing on its feet. Lord, I ask for your blessing. You know, we need your candlestick, Lord. And, you know, just help us be motivated. Help me to motivate people. Help people to motivate me to just do these first works, Lord, because that's why we're here. To help people to profit um, each other, to profit our families, Lord, to profit our children, and to profit, you know, those people outside, outside the, the walls of this church in this community, Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen.